Prologue. They say my music makes dogs howl, that it wakes the dead and hates the living, but I don't hear it that way, and neither do my cohorts. My music resonates the times. It echoes the world, today's and tomorrow's. It's the year 2033. I don't shut out reality with the gentle plucking of strings or the harmonic rhapsody of an orchestra. No pastoral symphony for me. The city floods into my art. The tripping of car alarms, the whooshing of cars, the wailing of fire engine sirens, the screeching of trucks, the whirring of police helicopters, and the booming of car stereo. These sounds grow the shell into which I drop those of the hearth. The ringing of the telephone, the droning of the television, the clicking of computer keys. These are my instruments, along with the piano, the violin, and the rest of the orchestra. Like a musical alchemist, I take ugly sounds and transmute them into art. I restore balance into a life from which it had escaped so long ago that there was no realization of its loss, much less desire for its return. Listeners find a way to make artistic sense out of our discordant lives. I stand guilty of loving humanity, of caring enough for people that I will risk my freedom of believing that we are the reflection of the Supreme Being so that the risk will not be so great. We have a short time on this earth, the wink of an eye, but life here is not all. We are likely to return again and again before we get it right. Yet the laws which threw me here into this cold steel cell were not faith, hope, and charity. They were bizarre codes of a skewed society, rules linked to electronic control of people. I didn't follow them, not out of a spirit of rebellion, but because I led an alternative way of life. I didn't fit in. I didn't turn on and tune out. Sometimes I listened to the quiet, which is never that. I'd lie on the carpeted floor of my beach town studio apartment, a bedsit, and listen to the seagulls. Or I'd gaze out the window over the tops of trees. I lived in the penthouse of a two-story wooden shack, two apartments on each floor. Looking out swelled my heart with elation. I pretended to live in the country. Sometimes I read books, 19th and 20th century novels, biographies of artists and composers who lived during a time when artists were not prohibitive, and I read travel tales about faraway places. And always, each morning, from four until eight, I wrote music. I arranged my waking and dreaming hours around music, the heart of my life. I couldn't squeeze in the daily four hours of screen watching required by the state, not with the job I needed to pay rent and buy food and the commuting from Long Beach to Century City on clogged Los Angeles freeways. It's my job that landed me here without music, except in my head and without a view, except in my memory. Perhaps it's unfair to blame my job. I could just as well blame people for allowing society to become what it has become, or music for seducing me, or my parents for conceiving me in April and giving birth to a free-thinking Aquarian, I could just as well blame myself. What do you think? You be the judge. Chapter One. What's that you've got there? Is that a book you're reading? asked a woman whose eyebrows arched in shock at the possibility. She projected clearly enough 
for Angelica to hear, and everyone else on an elevator so full that most held their breath for fear of being accused of goosing their neighbor. Angelica, however, had arrived recently in Los Angeles after four years of battling New York's lips, subway cars, and buses. Although raised in the English countryside, she had thought nothing of forging her way through the crowd, 26 floors above ground level. It was six o'clock and the end of her first week on a job. After muttering, sorry, a few times, she had created a space for herself and her open book near the back on the right, protected by a fort of three people taller than she. Is that a book? The woman asked again. Angelenos read strictly billboards on Sunset Boulevard, and those in the movie business read screenplays of 120 pages maximum, or at least carry them around to be read. Yes, Angelica said without looking up at the voice. What is it? the stranger asked, unable to restrain her intrusive curiosity at the novelty. Angelica thought, that this person must be a New Yorker, accustomed to making private conversation public and widening a dialogue to encompass other restaurant diners, other museum goers, other passengers on an elevator. New Yorkers like to talk. Angelica looked up. Her visual search skipped over the heads of many whose eyes met hers before she fixed on the stare of the questioner who stood on tiptoe from her space near the back on the left. Angelica Morgan wasn't embarrassed about being the center of attention. She had been out of Britain too long for that, and besides, her American mother often characterized the British predilection to reddened faces and stuttering sentences as a waste of energy. She was simply stunned. Anna Karenina, she answered. Oh, I just love the movie. So tragic, the woman emoted. The ending was so sad. I haven't read the end yet. Don't worry, I won't spoil it for you. The elevator landed in the lobby of one of the twin glass triangular Century Plaza towers in Century City, which had been a movie studio back lot. The doors opened and the crowd streamed out. Enjoy, Angelica's interrogator called out over her shoulder as she exited several people before Angelica. What a bizarre place L.A. is, Angelica thought. I attract attention reading, and when I reveal the novel's title, it's treated as though it's a screenplay, as though Tolstoy wrote it for Hollywood. I'm fortunate to be working with other people who read and to be living with others who do as well. To celebrate her good fortune, she took an escalator downstairs to peruse a wine shop on the ground level. Her short auburn curls and bluish-gray eyes heightened the richness of her creamy skin spun into honey by the sun. Angelica's unusual looks and pixieish figure turned heads before she reached the shop that was next door to a combination crystal and office supply store. The attention neither flattered nor upset her. She didn't blush or scowl. Her mind focused on the night and a toast to a new chapter in her life. Slowly, carefully, she scanned the wine on the three aisles and in the baskets on the floor at the counter. She chose a California Chardonnay to which her downstairs neighbor Liam had introduced her. She remembered savoring its full-bodied flavor tinged with hints of mango and thinking that sunshine must taste like that. It brought back memories of running through the field of yellow buttercups in May behind the bowl public house in Upton upon Severn. After her purchase, Angelica took another elevator to the subterranean parking lot where she had left her solar car, a 2030 Green Victory. When she left the lift in the climate-controlled building, she gasped for breath as she penetrated a wall of dry desert heat. The composer's high heels sang a fast clicking song as she passed row after row of cars until she reached F-16 posted on a concrete pole.
She threw her marine gabardine suit jacket into the back seat and studiedly arranged her wine and black leather handbag on the floor of the passenger seat before sliding into her sun-driven beauty. Then she unclasped her stockings from her garter belt and slipped them off before wiggling her toes into a pair of sandals which already bore their imprint thanks to New York's sweaty summers. <sighs> That's better, she said. She closed the door and rolled down the window, then started up the engine and turned the wheel. Thank you.